Hello, Dita. Welcome to the Creative Insider podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm a, it's a pleasure. You can introduce briefly yourself and tell everyone who doesn't know you yet who you are and what you do and what is your background a little bit. Sure, it's a, that's a that's a difficult task for me to do briefly because I have I have quite a few hats. Um, but uh, the main point for being here is, of course, that I wrote the book uh, Danish Design Heritage and Global Sustainability, and I chair the Danish Design Council. Um, I come from a background uh, originally from very different, more of a business background. Went into circular economy just because I saw that there was an opportunity to move from a realm of doing less bad to doing things in a new way that actually wouldn't just be less bad, but, but maybe move towards doing good. And then, um, you know, created a network on circular economy in Denmark with the Danish Ministry of um, Environment in Denmark at the time, Ida Augen, back in 2014, 2015. And then everything just kind of progressed from there towards really uh, moving into design and in particularly architecture. So have for uh, a number of years been very embedded with that. Uh, um, within uh, Linnea, uh, emerged my company, The Circular Way into Linnea, started um, doing advisory for, for developers, but in particularly turning um, waste streams from other industries into built products because there's this beauty of uh, the built environment uh, having you know, such a large footprint, but also um, thus such a large opportunity. So some of the waste streams that were coming from elsewhere, turning that in, which was a beautiful journey of learning to work with architects and engineers and, and designers at large. So that also meaning that I don't come from, an, from a design background myself. It's kind of something that's just um, through kind of, you know, how life happens just became so apparent to me that if we really, you know, want to create the change that we need uh, and, and you know, move towards somewhere where we can create value for people within the planetary boundaries, design is at the core. Um, and from there, everything just else moved along. So now, uh, yeah, a bunch of different things, but also then being the... Um, Chief Innovation and Science Officer at uh, Blockshop, hoping to to move the built environment in particular uh, towards um, you know regeneration and at least towards doing something in a better way. Because the thing I think for me is like I didn't start out in the built environment, but once you've worked within the built environment and you've seen how how grand the problem is, it's very difficult to leave behind because there's such you know the bigger the problem the bigger the opportunity in that sense what uh, really captivated me because uh, you um have written other books um already you have um you have your own website the circularway.com um it's that in this last book you are diving into the danish design heritage uh, a little bit in the background of Scandinavian design and um, everyone that works in design and architecture it's somehow influenced uh, at one point of their studies or career with this uh, philosophy and I'm curious uh, in your book through your research uh, what were your foundings what makes this uh, design so special uh, so influential around the world and in the end what are the le the lessons um, that you discovered that can be applied for the future of um, circularity in the economy and in design in particular yeah yeah, yeah. i did uh, previously do this book a change maker's guide to the future with anas linea the the, uh, the architect that i work with um on circularity in buildings and then uh, during uh, COVID, um, I had this sort of uh, project of writing uh, with the with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation this primer on or the, this sort of piece on you know uh, designing for circularity the Danish way, and that was how it started. And then I sort of 
looked into, okay, what does it actually mean to design for circularity the Danish way? And it very much came from you know, what we were doing in present time uh, with, with circular building materials and designing for circularity. But it just um, kind of, uh, you know, a little bit, to be honest, by coincidence struck me of like this sort of, okay, uh, this tradition of Danish design, you have so much, and, and originally it was about furniture. You have so many brilliant, beautiful pieces that are still in use today. They've been produced in the 50s and the 60s. That's, to be honest, like the majority of my home today is is is, is made of those furnitures. And they still have value because they cared about use value, about the craft of the material of uh, um, the the of actually doing the whatever uh, design you were producing, and then aesthetics, and then from there grew an interest like how is it that you know like today we just throw everything away, rarely things are used for uh, more than uh, a few years. Um, like why is it that they they that they have that opportunity? And I think that sort of the, the you know actually just caring about use value rather than exchange value is a key component uh, then there's this sort of um, form follows function which is about the individual design but it's also about putting the user first so if you look at design today maybe a bit too often we value the success of design based on how many items are you know, uh, sold across the counter and a little bit too less of like, is it actually creating value for people? And that really, for me, became the uh, the sort of like what ignited the book that that if you look at Danish design and what we celebrate today, it's that there was this sort of like it was a like there was this sort of you had the functionality of it, you had the aesthetics, but then you also had the social purpose because the, when when Danish design really thrived was after the two world wars, so we had a very clear social purpose of needing design to help build and rebuild society, create value for people, democratize um, and and create well being and just sort of welfare from a from a from a from an initial standpoint, and that wasn't something that was. Uh, you know, was a barrier that created a lesser design from an aesthetical perspective. On the contrary, it was actually something that heightened the aesthetical design of the project. And it is a key component to what we today celebrate as an aesthetic style of Danish design. So for me, that was super interesting when you, when you know, like coming from that maybe a bit too often today, we have a cultural understanding of, you know, if, if it's sustainable, it's, you know, it's uglier, it's, it costs more, it's less convenient. Uh, when in fact, if, if, if we dare to use um, the planetary boundaries as a positive creative constraint, we can actually move beyond and deliver more than, than what we have today. Mm. But um, what I noticed is that um, these pieces of furniture are definitely classics, but by becoming classics, they also uh, become um, iconic and people want to have them. And that's why they start becoming also more expensive. And uh, also in order to... Um, in order to make it... Um, so durable that it lasts so long also the materials are of a certain quality and that also uh, raises the price and um, of course uh, Scandinavia, Scandinavia it's like a very rich region but uh, the three points of sustainability is to be also social um, accessible for everyone um, are there some models of tweaking this um, uh, economy that can make it affordable for everyone i'm thinking about nowadays it's very um, popular to have uh, subscription models right like you pay netflix and you watch all the movies you want kind of things and so maybe i don't know do a subscription to a furniture uh, house that will take care of your furniture for 
Yeah, I think that's a really, really important point. And I think that the Danish design heritage actually delivered quite well on that originally because I think a key component was also that Danish design heritage um, developed in synergy with the Danish welfare state. Uh, so there was this sort of a lot of like more people had the ability to buy quality, but fewer people had uh, the opportunity to buy luxury or like frosting, if, if 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 you will, in that regard. And I think that was actually a key component to 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 if if if, if you, and and in that sense, an example of a, a market economy that worked because the societal model was you know, on top of the market economy and sort of designing how, you know, what we wanted for for, for the market economy to do for us as a tool. Because obviously, uh, the you know, the book being Danish Design Heritage and Global Sustainability is not about uh, doing more of the same. I think if you, even if you go back, that was never the intention of the heritage Carl Clint, the sort of original original founder of, of the Danish modern, he was the professor who fa- was the first professor founding the um, the furniture school at the Danish uh, Royal Academy, and he had this, uh, I think, for me, really nice notion of saying, you know, uh, the future is built in in the intersection between, and I'm I'm loosely translating this because he said it in Danish, but nonetheless. Uh, the future is found in the intersection between the heritage and the tradition being the accumulated experience, but in combination with opportunities of the current and maybe what we need to add today is, of course, also the problems of of the current times. Um, so for me, it really more than anything comes down to that philosophical idea of design's ability to ask questions i think if you you know if you look at um at architecture today uh f- you know form follows function could also be translated to asking the question of why do we design buildings why do we build do we build because buildings are a fundamental human right or do we build because it's an object of speculation? And I think that's something that we need to, there's also an opportunity for, you know, get inspired and use that, use the heritage to say we can do better if we are ambitious and if we dare to raise those questions and, and move in a different direction. I think it's similar, like for me, I'm, I'm at home right now, and it's act, it's in the, the apartment was uh, originally uh, it was an attic that um, that was like of no use. That Paul Hennings, the Danish lamp designer, turned into a um, his studio and home. And I had actually not I, I'm I'm not a big fan actually of of Paul Hennings' aesthetics necessarily, so I hadn't really dived into him. But then with 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 buying this, this apartment, I, I and, and the book, I dive more into it, and I found this really really. For me, something that really hit was that he said, like in the 40s, when when you had um, uh, the Second World War and Denmark was occupied by Germany, he because he had he has always ha- he always had a very strong social purpose in his career as well. He created this magazine called Critis um, Review, so it's like critical uh, review thinking uh, kind of thing. But he was also doing like songs for the theaters and he created this song that's a very, very sort of like something that everybody knows in Denmark today. Uh, and it was a, a resistance movement song that essentially, again, loosely translated with something like you can tie us on mouth and hand, but you can never occupy our minds. And he proved that in the most brilliant way because he actually uh, sort of wrapped it in to be a love song at one of the theaters that was playing. So it actually passed German censorship. But then once it was played at the theater, because it was played to Danes who were occupied at that time, they rich, they, they, they they immediately got the message and rose up and song, sang along. And, and it, it was like passed out through theaters without Denmark. But my reason for saying it now is that 
Then about 10 years later, right before uh, he, he created this apartment, he was in, in the UK and he, was, he came back and said, wait, like something is happening. We are, we are actually, we've, we've kind of never been less free because mass production um, somehow mastered to occupy our minds. And I thought that was a really interesting point of like, you know, sort of like um, that we've put the cart before the horse and how do we recalibrate that of, you know, why do we design? Are we um, world makers or are we in service to the world breakers? Why do we build? Do we build because there's a need from a human perspective for it or do we build because there is a, a need to drive a new investment and it's become an asset class in that regard and so for me that just became a really really interesting journey of of discovery and seeing that there's you know which is uh, both a bit frightening and, and, and positive but that some of the thoughts that have been going on for a long time we still can learn a lot from um but it all comes down to our uh, ability to to um to question all of the things that we take for granted as sort of natural ways of being that are actually socially constructed. And then from there, the sort of the, the courage to then imagine something new and shape something new, give shape and, you know, giving shape to something is, is there, there's nothing better than design for that. And then I think a key component for, for the Danish design heritage is then to say, okay, Right, having a societal purpose is a positive creative constraint, not 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 a weakness. Um, and then the form function follows functionality as well. That's but, very long. No, I understood everything, and it's a great uh, story that you did there, and uh, the whole loop to understand what uh, how the two uh, resistances. And during the war, and then how this uh, applies for design. Um, but for, for thinking about it and and thinking through seeing the different opinions, one thing also that helps me is that I have a very um, wide background internationally because I was born in Bulgaria. I still have connection to Bulgaria. I, I was raised in Italy and uh, now I live in Germany and uh, I have more connection to Scandinavia and so on. Every single culture approaches uh, this um, circular economy in a different way. And um, everything makes me think that the only possible solution to put together sustainability and economy because on one side we cannot destroy the economy because uh, we have learned from the past that consumism in a certain way is good because it makes everyone somehow um, richer or there is more abundancy but also consuming and generating trash is not the possible way mm, the only business model is some sort of subscription model which is uh, maybe also frightening because it means not owning anything, just <laughs> lending stuff. And uh, <clears throat> I don't know, I can imagine about uh, all the things that surround us. Uh, we get all these Amazon boxes. Uh, we buy this furniture from Ikea, which is also Scandinavia, but it's a different kind of Scandinavia where you buy this furniture that maybe it's not of this high quality, but it's practical. Um, the, in your research, um, have you also noticed or have created ideas about uh, what could be what could be also the economy of this kind of design because also architecture that's a good question it's a very big question now often seen me as an architect we ask this uh, ourselves very often if we need to build in some cases yes because people are moving <laughs> from i don't know different countries to the cities or from the countryside in the city and they have to stay somewhere but you cannot move the houses <laughs> you can move only the people so what are the possible uh, business models or economical models that can um yeah make yeah. this circular design flourish yeah and uh, i mean and this is it's essentially where it really gets hard right because this is about also um 
you know, asking questions to the system and the, the things we take for granted in that regard. And so I think we all come from a, a, an economic understanding of growth, meaning um, uh, benefits for all lesser uh, inequality and and better opportunities for all. And historically, for a very long time, that was true in the Western world, and it still is true, I believe, in for, for a large part of the world. But what we see in, in the developed economies, that stopped somewhere in the late 70s. Growth didn't continue to be a tool to drive improvement and well-being for people it became something else and so for me it's um you know there's it's it's very popular of, of talking about degrowth and, and and all these things and and for me it's more about saying can we reclaim growth as that tool we want it to be for what we want to achieve so grow the things we want stop the other things but 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 mainly saying we do really need to reassess how is it that we create value for people while staying within the planetary boundaries. And we, um, for me, we are, it's, it's a super difficult duality of, of doing better in the short term within the system. So like all of the different things that we can do within reuse, recycling, using biogenic materials rather than uh, fossil-based materials, I think we need to do that. But at the same time, we need to be mindful and able to question that. Why is it, is it, is it going back to Paul Henningsen's point on, on sort of having our minds occupied by mass production? Is it, is it, a val- like, uh, is it of value for me that I feel, you know, if I, if I have a, uh, if I need to go to a large party or if I have a large event, oh, it would be better to have a new shirt or something of that sort, kind of like, is that coming from me internally or is it something that has been created outside? And 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 in the book, I touch upon it as well because after reading that story about Paul Henningsen, I dived into some of this sort of, you know, what was that, you know, what was happening around mass production at that time? And there was a, this really interesting uh, book by this uh, sort of like pioneering American uh, marketing uh, guru, Edward Bernay, and I'm not sure I pronounce his name rightly, but something of that sort. And he wrote this book, Propaganda, which I think is also quite interesting, where at that point it was actually not a problem to call a book propaganda. Probably no marketing guru today would would, would label their book that unless it was uh, ironic. But nonetheless, at that point, it was no problem. And he, he, he's just very specific in saying, right, so now we have this opportunity to mass produce uh, from a technological standpoint. So now it's my job to make sure that human desires fit the capabilities of the, of the mass production system. And I think that, again, coming back to needing to put you know, recalibrate that we put the the, uh, the cart before the horse. Techno- te- technology is, of course, a key component to the future, it, but it will not solve everything. And we need to to recalibrate a lot of things in order for technology to be that solution in order to get there. And that's a super difficult challenge because systems change has always been extremely difficult but we have never been at a place where it's been more difficult because we have such a, a centralized unity of power and resources to an even bigger degree when we had than when we had you know the Catholic Church and, and whatnot being in into play and and one of the reasons for for me to mention that is also that I have this chapter on on systems change, where I kind of start by looking back toward to um, to Thomas Kuhn, who then and this is sort of book on um, um, on the necessity of scientific uh, paradigm shift and 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 scientific uh, revolutions. Um, the sort of very sort of easily understandable being that at one point we thought that the Earth was flat. 
And then we realized that the earth was round, but that was a super difficult thing to do because one, um, it was extremely frightening. Two, what Thomas Kuhn uh, alludes to, and like even, you know, um, uh, Machiavelli and the, this book, The Prince, also says it so clearly. The innovator has no friends because there's no one really benefiting yet from what, what the innovator does, but there's so many that has so much vested interest in, in, the, in the current system. Um, so it just goes to say that it's a really, really difficult task but I do think that we, you know, if, if you fully acknowledge that we've entered the Anthropocene, that means acknowledging that what we do as humans affects the planet and that affects our ability to thrive. And that's not sort of um, a side thing that you can put next to all these other scientific disciplines. That's, that needs to be embedded in the core and we still have yet to do that from a scientific and from, from a societal perspective. And that's a battle that we need to engage in long-term uh, and be mindful of when we create short-term solutions. It should never be that we then sort of like say, oh, we should not do anything short-term because it isn't really the long-term solution. We need, we need to also do a lot of the short-term thinking, but we need to be mindful of that long-term perspective because... Growth, yes, let's reclaim it, but understanding our uh, societal value creation uh, via growth as a goal needs to go away. Gro growth is one tool, one means out of many to assess our societal well-being, but, but it can't have the, the, the sort of overarching role that it has today. And I think it's, you know, it's... it's um, I, I, I uh, you know, not coming from the from the from the um, architectural or design background, but coming from 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 a more sort of business school, but at the business school also a very sort of uh, political and philosophical part of, of the business school, studying Lu Nicholas Luhmann and systems theories, and sort of like saying, okay, there are a lot of subsystems, and then there's one overarching system, which is society, and then you have subsystems, which would be, you know, the capital markets, it would be media, it would be the political systems, it would be a bunch of different systems. And they all are part of the subsystems that make sure that the overarching societal system works. And today, I think we probably need to recalibrate that a bit so that we make sure that society not the capital system is actually the overarching system going back to again, you know, historically, um, you know, the finan financial services has always been a part of building buildings, right? Because there was a developer that saw a need uh, and then needed um, liquidity in order to build that building. And then the financial sector provided that service which makes a lot of sense and they made money on that and that's absolutely fine. Um, but today, are there a fairly large amount of buildings being built because buildings today, real estate as, is to such a large degree an asset class that you almost have developers in service of the financial sectors in order to generate returns? I think that has definitely happened and that's something that we need to be mindful of in, in order to really move towards a better world. Indeed. Um, when you say we, who are you um, thinking in particular of? Also, when you wrote this book, every time a person writes a book has a ideal audience in mind or an ideal reader in their mind. Um, and you mentioned these uh, systems, right? The different systems, how they cooperate together but i'm thinking that um, this is a global uh, global problem that we cannot solve uh, just uh, let's say in the most western hemisphere of the of the planet we have to solve it all together and um, this um, i think that the different uh, countries are at different stages of this history maybe we are more further uh, in the forefront, but there are big economies like India, China, uh, Brazil, 
in which uh, countries now are starting to have more money also in the lower uh, layers of the society and they want to consume more. So um, I don't know. Who did you think about when you're writing the book? Yeah. So um, it may sound a little bit, I've had it, have it like, because now it's been like two weeks since I released it and people are like coming up. Oh, this is so great that you like, you know, you really deserved that, that you have this, the success now after like all the hard work that you did. And I was like, yeah, but actually I just kind of really liked writing the book for me. That was like, and I kind of like, that's, um, so to, to some degree, I, I kind of, um, it's it maybe sounds odd, but I didn't necessarily write it with a particular audience in mind. I wanted to create change, but it was also that I actually really liked the process of doing it. That said, of course, um, as a Dane, it's something that I like within the last 10 years and continuously are becoming mindful of my complete uh, and other blind spots of what is actually the state of the world. You know, we have this tendency to be like, okay, if we can just, you know, if we can just move before, you know, beyond four kilo CO2s per square meter in Denmark, check problem solved. No, in no way. I, because um, one, as you say, it's obvious, like going back to housing being a human right. If we take that, at scale, what does that mean in terms of embedded carbon? Because that's a lot of people, that's a lot of buildings that needs to be built in order for, order for that to happen. And um, to be honest, that's still something that I'm exploring. And I, and I hope that the book can be of use in that regard. I went with um, UNIDO, so it's the UN's industrial uh, development organization, so the organization that helps uh, developing countries uh, industrialize. To uh, I, I went with them to Peru a few years ago, and that was such an interesting experience. They invited me because I'd done a talk at, um, at the UN where where someone in the audience had asked, had asked me, you know, that's great, you cannot do all that, but what are the developing countries uh, going to do? And I, in my answer, uh, being a bit provocative and, and in no mean uh, intending to um, not realize the privilege of coming from the Western world or the difficulties of being in the developing world at all. But if we looked at it from, you know, a not, not of all of the embedded uh, socioeconomic perspective, but just that it's, it might actually be a benefit that you haven't done all the wrong things. You haven't invested in all the wrong infrastructure yet. In Denmark, we have the, you know, we it, it was such a great idea for a long time to create all of the, the, um, the waste uh, burning plants uh, in order to get energy. But that was based on, you know, we, we thought that the waste had no value and it was supplementing heat coming from oil uh, and gas at best. Now we know that the waste can do so much more and we have better heating alternatives, but we have so much CapEx invested in those models and so much vested interest in that. So I think, which is so easy to say and so difficult to do, I hope that the book can serve as a sort of footprint for how can we rethink how we go about doing things, not taking everything that the Western world has done the last 50, 60 years as a sort of only way of going about, but challenging that a bit. But it is for me also very sort of exploratory grounds. I'll go to, um, Kigali, the the um, the capital of Rwanda, in two weeks, and 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 do a bunch of things, in particularly uh, attending uh, Unleash and, and our board meeting there, but also talking at you know to some of the universities and, and stuff like that uh, about the book. Which, to be honest, I'm very very excited to do, but it's also a little fright, little bit frightening. Does it resonate what the book says or, or not? Because as of now, I mean, that's yet to, you know, 
I can think that hopefully it will, but but it isn't until I really have that connection, um, which is yet to be had, that I that I know that it it, it will actually be of value to them. One one just very simple example is um, in my previous work uh, with Linear the Circular Way, we um, took these uh, draft master kegs for from Carlsberg, which is a composite plastic and turn it into new materials, um, facade uh, elements, uh, tables, chairs, etc. cetera. Um, and it was from a design perspective, it made so much sense that, you know, they had gone to the existing value chain. They were not able to see that it could be, a, uh, that, it, that it would be profitable to recycle it because it was a composite. So a, a, a mix of polymers. Uh, and for us, from a design perspective, it was a, a, um, there was, of course, also technical uh, difficulties with it being a composite. But it also meant because each polymer has a different melting point. So when once you, you heat it a little bit, it actually started looking a bit like marble because each polymer then had a different, like how much it melted um, in that sense. I think I actually have some over here. Sorry. Oh, go so ahead. Because I have them. Like if you if you melt it a little bit, it would be like this, where you still have like a lot. But if you melt it a little bit more, then it becomes a bit like what of the marble perspective of it. And then, anyways, we could turn that into to new products with design as um, as as the as the core. But but why I thought of it now was because. Uh, then we were um, approached by NGOs to help uh, because in um, not in in Wanda but in Uganda because after the Wanda wars there there was um, a very large refugee camp created there, um, which if you can imagine like that this and this project was three years ago so. You know the, the 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 team. I I never actually had the chance to go myself, uh, but the but the colleagues that went. You know they met people that were born and had given birth in the camp, which is of course not how a refugee camp is supposed to be. It's supposed to be temporary, and you can't build for anything but temporary structure. So you could imagine like they had this the camp, and then you just saw all of the three of, of the trees from there just getting cut down because they needed to build with it. And then you had rain and then uh, they needed new wood, et cetera, because it was, it, it was um, being instructed by the rain. So what we then were asked to do was like, you have this very simple way of, of uh, recycling um, composite plastics in the camps. We have a lot of plastic waste. Can you come help do that? And we did. Um, and that turned into these sort of like, so they could have, these um, roofing elements for for the camp, for the camp and 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 that worked, but in particular it worked because we could then uh, have the Danish government buy it for for a pavilion that we did for um, for Denmark at the Milan Design Week, which Lenea had then designed. Uh, because what was also uh, and what we had not at all thought about uh, in our design process and only came to my attention actually fairly later that that was an issue that because you have uh, your roofs as a very um, uh, defining sort of element to what status you are, you are at. So for your roof to be made out of waste, regardless of the function, was just not, you know, it was just a no go uh, from 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 their perspective, but but it was something. It was a complete blind spot of of mine. So it was only later that I that I that I that I that I realized that. And I think that's yeah, that's some of the uh, the blind spots I still have on in terms of saying will the book work in in that in 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 a bunch of different regions. I hope that there will be value adds and learnings for all but i think it's um most likely there will also be some things that are are not valuable and and hopefully i, I you know we can all learn from each other and and get better well i think uh, it will have an impact if the book um offers some ideas to 
achieve um, some of the needs that these people have in a better way for inconvenient way for them, I think. Uh, but I mean, that's only for the readers to say after they have uh, gotten access to the book. Uh, you said that you love the process also of writing a book. Um, I'm curious, what was your process? How long it took you to write the book? And uh, how did the research you did look like? Because I guess it's a heavily uh, research book based on a lot of research. <laughs> Yeah, I mean it. It it was it was uh, two and a half years, I think, in total. Which of course was like not only book. It, there was a lot of other things going on, and I think that's uh, that that gained value, but it also made it more difficult because um, I think uh, I think Rutledge, the publisher, normally they have like professors that's done a course a number of times, and they turn it into books, so they know what they want to put in. Um, for me, the the process of writing the book was actually also um, aligning my own thoughts and getting comfortable with my own thoughts. So in that sense, um, I also changed a bit along the way, kind of like how I saw things or how I felt that things should be thra- framed. So I actually uh, handed in the book the first time last summer took it back because I wasn't comfortable with it after the summer holidays. I was like something is missing. And then I thought, Oh, I just need to write this chapter and then everything will be as I wanted. But then you kind of like re revisit things. And then I wanted, and, and essentially like that was, I did that in September and I did like some new, like two new chapters and and just like in my gut, I just didn't feel like fully comfortable with it. So um, after Christmas this year, I went to our, our summer house uh, uh, on the island of Bonholm, where my dad is originally from. So I've been there a lot throughout my childhood and, and also adult life, and and really love it. It's a, it's a it, the nature there is just amazing and also quite different and more rough than you have in anywhere else in Denmark. So it's just like for me, it's like the perfect place to be in January. Uh, this, this this sort of little town where where the summer house is at is 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 very beautiful. You have like you have the sea, you have the forest, but you also have the Hamaknulen, which is a like a, a key natural component. But it also means that there is absolutely nothing going on in January. There's just dark, 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 and people aren't really even home because that's also their opportunity to take holiday because it's a little bit you know like you 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 have you know it's seasonal so you have tourists in the summer um so you work during the summer uh if, if you're local but anyways i went there and i wrote on it and then i had like i think i've been there for i had like two weeks and like the first week when i finished that like friday evening i sat and I was like there's something and then I created like I was I was like I had this sort of the overall structure in Google Docs and I just created a copy and said this sort of like the reimagined version of it and then I moved all of the chapters around and then I went to bed and then I woke up the next morning and realized yeah it should actually be the new version where the chapters are completely differently structured and and that makes me feel so much better on it so it's um yeah, but it's uh it, yeah as we talked about, I I did do the the a change maker's guide to the future and in, in the book in 2018, which was only built environment and circularity with Anna's Linnea, and it was published by the philanthropic um, organization Galdenia. So there wasn't a publishing house, and there wasn't the rigorousness of of, of a publishing house for better or worse. Um, so it's a very different process, but I, you know, I, I like that process. I came out of that thinking, ooh, if I'm going to do this again, I'm going to do this and this and this thing differently. And in this process, I came out with the same feeling of saying like, ooh, maybe I should try this again. And then I will do this and this and this thing differently. And I think that's, I, I won't write a new book anytime soon, but but hopefully I'll remember to take the learnings that uh that I want to do similar, but also the things that I want to do differently 
if I if I do it again. How do you write um, the book? Uh, I mean, you started with this core idea, which is the now somehow translated in the title of the book. Do you set up uh, what you think, what are the main topics and then uh, research on them and then cluster the topics somehow in chapters? Because uh, for someone that hasn't written a book like me, it sounds a very frightening process to start on a blank page <laughs> and fill those pages with uh, different topics. Yeah. And actually that's like at one point I want like I want to try that process of starting on a blank page because I've never done that. I've always had like you know, maybe I've written a um opinion piece for somewhere and then I have like a piece here and a piece here and a piece here, and then that's sort of like a, a core frame and then I and then I, and I write new things and I mix everything together. Um which I think I've needed in order to just be able to do it, but but I actually kind of dream of that sort of like one day going to Bonholm or somewhere similar, just sitting for three months, starting on a blank piece of, piece of paper, having that sort of going back to, you know, like having the planetary boundaries as a positive creative constraint, having a positive creative strain. I cannot, you know, uh, use anything no reuse whatsoever you just need to start completely over but 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 i'm like you that would be a, like so far that would have been like so daunting and and so so as of now it's been saying like yeah okay I have these ideas i have these sort of like things from here and here because um yeah, like what you're saying with starting with a blank piece of paper, that's just been too daunting. So if I, I've always started with saying like I have something here and I have something here and I have something here, and then it's it's a bit sort of more doable to write the in betweens. Yeah, connecting the dots. And um, do you struggle with um, sitting and writing actually? Because there is this, you know. Uh, it's renowned that it's uh, somehow frightening, you know, to sit every time and write. Do you struggle with that to sit down and write, or uh, if yes, how do you overcome this, or is it always for you very pleasant to sit and start playing with your thoughts? I wish uh, it always was. It isn't. Um, however, what I really like, if I go away and go like you know be secluded then i've actually never experienced that it wasn't pleasant the problem for me is if i think that i can you know wake up a bit early and just write for two hours and then go about doing daily life and be in the city and stuff like that then i sit and you know either i'm not able to write anything or i i feel like what i'm writing is just like really really bad and and then and it just becomes this sort of negative thought spiral of some sort so i definitely recognize that for me the tool is really like it takes time to get into that sort of energy and and space and you need you know more than anything you need to leave your phone very very you know your phone all types of social medias very far away and just just be with the thought process of writing but luckily I've never experienced if I give myself that opportunity and really do that then I've always found it pleasant to write but but I've definitely had uh, more than a few of, of not you know of just feeling like what it, like how how much I tried and sort of like and it was just like there was nothing that I found to be of interest or value or, or, you know, it just sounded stupid kind of, and there was like nothing interesting come popping up. Um, so my, my, my advice would definitely uh, be to take the time, remove yourself from the, all of the daily stimuli that we have, uh, and 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 allow yourself to be in in that process and then i think it's a balance i have like as much i have this sort of like this dream of the you know the blank page um but at the same time also knowing that 
I would not like even if I had that opportunity, uh, I would not have yet to be able to write that. So maybe it's also you know starting somewhere and then realizing that it's a journey you don't get from zero to a hundred in in the first instance. And do you have some method of journaling, also like writing uh, per hand down things? Do you have some method to do that? Because yeah. I, I know that very uh, writers, a lot of writers use some form of journaling. Or do you yeah. do it also for you personally? I don't know if you can expand on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have I have my journal um, that I, 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 for me, like remembering uh, is very much writing by hand. So uh, I, 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 I prefer to have my journal in, in, in all things. And then it's um, the, the, like the, the journal is where you sort of like you have like these bottoms where you, you click in the new uh, round of paper. And then I put the old rounds of papers uh, in, in, a, in, a, in sort of like uh, they, they're all stacked together. Um, but, but yeah, for me, for sure, uh, journaling and that but that comes that's about writing but it's also just my way of processing thoughts I know and people continuously laugh at me because like do you realize how much easier it would be if you if you you know if you had a google docs or if you had like a note system and you could just like categorize everything and you just have the things automatically at the computer and I fully acknowledge that that would, and, and there are many times when I wish I had done that uh, in, in, you know, when you need to get something just done quickly um, for sure. But um, for me, I, I, writing in hand, having my journal and, and, and knowing that I stack everything. And I do actually go back to my old journals and look through them uh, when, when I need to be, you know, remember something. Um, so for me, that's that's absolutely key and, and something that I I hope I never have the desire to change. No, yeah, definitely. Uh, also, I think that um, Google mm, Notes or all these digital tools, um, you cannot think the same way when you type in things. It's different when you uh, write down. It's much quicker. It's like... You know, you put your thoughts directly in your fingers and uh, it's a completely different uh, process than that. And um, what has been the... So how did you... You have a publisher, I guess. You're not self-publishing the book. Uh, do you have any feedback? Uh, because also you are now... Like, it's not your first book. It's like your third book, if I'm not wrong. Uh, second, sorry. Uh, but I'm sure there will be a third. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah, who, what kind of people have reached out to you or what publishers are saying? Um, do they give you some goals to publish a book that it has to sell so many copies or how does it work that thing? Because it's a very specific book. Yeah, well, 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 the first book was... Um... That was financed by uh, the philanthropic organization Real Dania on getting our experience with building with circular materials and building the circular way out. So there was no, like it was financed by them, but there was no publisher. So we could, you know, we, we'd given the, the sort of like, you know, the application, but we could then kind of do as we wished, which had a lot of benefits, but also, of course, some, some constraints because we were not... Um, you know, it's not our, our skill set and our profession. Uh, this book was by Rutledge, um, which is a, a very sort of um, rightfully esteemed uh, social science and, and other sciences uh, academic publishing house. And I chose them for that reason because I, I it's uh, for me, it's like, um, um, I think I have a little bit of sort of, you know, uh, um, uh, sort of like I'm looking into this to the world of science and I'm a little bit envious of them or like or, or, or I'm a little bit sort of like they're they're my idols so I kind of want so I was very yeah I wanted that 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 academic proof of of yeah uh, sort of like a like that yeah, approval yeah in that sense um 
so I, I I approached them and said I have this idea and uh, and I they had they had previously uh, saw saw the uh, the first book but but of and, and had been interested in that but given that that was open source it wasn't really a, and, and it turned out not to really be an interesting thing to publish for 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 a publisher of course um so I yeah we talked when I had that idea I I went to them and they luckily went for it and I knew that from like due to their sort of standing within the academic science sort of realm, I, that was who I wanted to go with. Um, so I was very happy with that. But that said, with everything, you know, you have like, I chose them for that. And then you, you know, there's like, you have that, this view, but then of course there's all these things that you did, you don't see. And there was very much also that I really appreciate them, um, especially, especially the editorial team. Uh, when it went to the production team, um, I had lots of struggles in, you know, that was never the, the purpose of the book. But but then you go into sort of like, you know, you have an editorial team, which is like, you know, they've chosen, they, you know, they're the ones who've gone to the editorial commission and said, we should publish this. They're the ones who know you get the vision and there your line goes to production. It's a little bit more like, like everything else, and then you become like then it was a little bit more treated as their traditional um, academic book, which by no means it's not. I don't have that uh, capability, but but I I hope and I and I do believe that I have a lot of other capabilities coming from practice in that sense. But but there was um, quite a bit of struggle of, of making sure that I could keep my tone of voice and, and that perspective in, in that regard, um, which I understand. It was just that it was a, it was a blind spot that I hadn't been mindful of. So, you know, maybe if I, if I, if I, if I do do a third book, I'll, it, it might make sense to, to do a little bit less, uh, of a of a, an academic rigorous publishing house somewhere in between maybe maybe you could uh, also i've talked to many people now that you can now it's quite easy to be self publisher to for a book um there are many tools and actually it's so funny because um Amazon, it's usually the worst, <laughs> the worst corporation for sustainability. But in terms of uh, self-publishing, it's quite sustainable because then um, they have the smart thing that they print only the books that get ordered. Uh, so it's uh, it's super uh, it's super interesting uh, concept. Yeah. Um, I think like I for sure like if so there's uh, for me like one I I um. This book, uh, I think it would have been like in in the sense of how I leaned in and how I was on my own, I think I would have been difficult to be comfortable with that from a self-publishing perspective. So I, 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 I kind of like needed that proof of, of, of from, from, from their side to really feel comfortable putting um, those thought, thoughts into to paper. And then the other side, they they were also in in the editorial part really really good. Before we made the final agreement, like they had, you know, three three professors that uh, that I, I was actually never allowed to know who was because they they were they were they, you know they hired them to be anonymous so that they could really feel comfortable of just you know. <laughs> saying whatever they felt about the, this this synopsis and, and and what I wanted to do with the book. It was prior to the book being written. Um, but they then luckily felt that it was a good idea and I was a good person to write it. But they also came with so many, um, you know, like, okay, she's trying to do too much. She should really, like, focus. This is the part that's super interesting. And then, by the way, this is the new research coming out in that and that and that. She should read that. And for me, like, you know, it was due to them that I got all of that really, really nice feedback on my synopsis, but also on super relevant um, new research coming in. And, and that was like, you know, I, I wouldn't have been able to, to, you know, 
get that myself or or become acquainted with that myself so so i think um yeah may, you know who knows in the future but i i don't think necessarily self publishing is is for me mm. and um well, to conclude a little bit our conversation um what do you hope to see in the next years uh, as trends in the different design industries uh, for more circularity or yeah what are your expectations in the future in this kind of uh, field after all the background or your work and your research you have done i hope so much that you know whatever i say today i will be blown away because i don't have the ability to imagine what will be the the sort of future of design three years from now with that i mean that design really leans into that opportunity of being world makers rather than world you know in service of world breakers that we are that there's a little bit too much of a tendency today but but you know, it all comes down for me success comes down to are we able to create value for people while staying within the planetary boundaries or not and if we're not then designers need to say hey guess what time is our most precious resource if this project ain't doing that then i need to do something else because spending time on things that aren't moving us in the right direction is de facto a bad choice mm. yeah well i hope so too i think that uh, from my perspective uh, somebody that works in the field of architecture and uh, working even in Germany, which is a little bit of a more conservative and slower to develop uh, <laughs> on new things country. Uh, it's, a, it's a big topic and uh, uh, people are working on it and we are working on it. And it's not just, uh, we're not trying to do greenwashing. We are trying to really find a feasible solution that will be sustainable according to the ecological sustainability, economical, and also for the social sustainability. So I, I think it's uh, it's changing, and uh, I'm happy that there are also people like you that um, put even the uh, needle a little bit further so that it uh, makes us think a lot. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, I think that's, yeah, and I think that's great. And I think it's like, you know, it's very easy to write a book as, and about what things should ideally be like. That doesn't mean that things does, that doesn't look exactly like that isn't great. Like, I think for me, more than anything, we need to be biased towards action. So even the smallest steps are worth celebrating as long as it doesn't become greenwashing, which for me means that we say, yay. I, you know, I used this amount of recycled material, then it's thus it's perfect or thus it's sustainable. No, of course not. We're all on a journey. Like I think, you know, we have yet to really fully um, produce that, you know, sustainable building to, to that degree. So, so finding that balance of like, where do we want to go long-term, but also recognizing that, you know, all the work that everyone does little by little is, is the necessary steps that we did we need to take because otherwise we're never gonna create be able to create that shift. So I think that's great. Yeah. Me yeah too. in the conservative German industry. Well, I'm I'm wishing you all the best for the book. I hope that many people will read it and uh, that it will have a positive response. And I say to every guest of the Creative Insider, this was your ta first time on the podcast. But of course, it doesn't have to be the last one. And whenever there are some news around uh, what interests you or around as a new book or some new activity you're working on, um, you're always welcome on the stage to talk about it. And thank you very much for spending uh, a pleasant hour with uh, with me and the, and the audience of the Creative Insider. Thank you very much for having me. I hope in like maybe, you know, a year's year time, I'll come back and sort of like what, what, how did it work on a global scale with cultures different from, you know, the European culture? That, that would be super interesting. You're very welcome to, that would be a very interesting discussion. So you're always welcome back. You just text me and we're going to make it happen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good evening. You too. Thanks.